Her name is engraved on a satellite that is now at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. It used to be in space, and now it's at the bottom. Everyone, please welcome Mallory. What did the janitor say when he came out of the closet? Supplies. <laughs> that has nothing to do with my talk. I just wanted to loosen you up before I get a little bit sacrilegious about some things. So, hello and welcome to my favorite conference. Um, a few years ago, actually at the last time it was live, I spoke at DCR about dashboards, and I mentioned this dreamboat of a package that makes beautiful visualizations called High Charter. That's a morning of visualization theme, which is great. But it has come to my attention that you still don't use it. So while I have the floor, we're going to talk about High Charter. OK, what is it and why? So High Charter is an, an R wrapper for the beloved High Charts JavaScript library. It uh, makes interactive plots that are very pretty and very versatile. And interactive plots gets you many plots in one, which is uh, very convenient. Like, are you tired of passing plots back and forth between somebody trying to get it to be just you know, pretty enough and just useful enough, adding labels to things and modifying it so that someone can take it to someone else more important than you in a meeting that you're not invited to. Well, I can't help you with most of that, but I can at least shorten the iteration of plot edits by using something that is inherently going to be more useful. So uh, the other convenience is that it's syntactically similar to ggplot, so it's not really so bad to learn. All right, why will you like it? Same reasons, it's pretty, it's versatile, it's interactive, and it's not even hard. And interactive plots save you time. That is uh, one of the biggest things that, that you gain from this. So no more labeling bar heights. Uh, you can hover over top of things, and it populates with more context and without cluttering the space. No more plotting every single combination of comparisons because you can click to turn things on and off. Um, you can allow for zooming, so arbitrary zoom. So if you have some timeline, you're like, here it is, here's, the, here's a whole year, and they're like, okay, but can I also get one with a one month and then also get one with a, well, you can do anything you want, here it is, you can zoom. It's great. Also, people will respect you. <laughs> that it's uh, key. So. Sorry, I'm having a tech issue. And the best part is you get to use R. So you don't have to learn JavaScript in order to get all these uh, wonderful things. So why you should use it? There is a war on R, and it is time to show off. And we did not wage this war, but <laughs> um, moving on. <laughs> but seriously, why? Uh, so High Charter makes R look good. And you want to dress your data to impress. Um, we all benefit when you make R look good, because your company will want to keep hiring R users. Uh, if they see, they don't see what goes into it, they see the output. So if you're always handing off beautiful stuff, then that's going to make our R look good, and they'll be more likely to think of R as, uh, you know, not let Python take over, for example. Uh, it will make more people want to learn R. Um, and people expect fancy visualizations now. So, just in the modern world, everyday people, gamification, leaderboards, all of that, they, everyone is interacting with beautiful visualizations every day. You expect a plot, when you're looking at it online, to be able to interact with it. You don't expect a static PNG just in the world anymore. So people expect these things to be nice. So also, it really helps you justify R in a sea of Python users. So. I always say, oh, yeah, sure, I, I can do Python. That's fine. That's great. But R is for research. Python's for production, which has great alliteration. So, <laughs> so use it. But also, for me, it's definitely true. Um, for me, I mean, I say whatever you're the best at, most efficient at, that's probably going to be what you want to use for um, getting something done on the side or researching something before you want to put it into production. But 
Uh, because I can produce really beautiful visualizations and dashboards, nobody, seems, nobody cares that I'm the only one using R. And that's been true at quite a few companies that I've been at, where everyone else just expected me to use Python for everything. And I just, on the side, I just make all this stuff with R, and everybody likes what I make, so they let me keep doing it and don't really ask questions. So R is a way, uh, or High Charter has really helped me justify using R instead of Python, and that's what I'm into. Uh, yeah, also, again, we cannot let the Python bros win. So. All right, a guided tour from pluses to pipes. OK, so here we have a dashboard. We're going to walk through a tutorial. And how is that? I need a zoom. All right. I might have to zoom back in and out a little bit, but that seems acceptable for looking at code. All right, so we're looking at the diamonds package and just doing some subsets to a few of ideal premium good. OK, great. So first, we'll compare ggplot and high charter um, for a few things. So first, let's see this plot um, side by side. This is the ggplot without really any extra things added to it. And this is the same idea, the high charter version of this plot without adding any extra bells and whistles just adding a title and all that. So this is what I'm talking about with the interactivity and the hover, um, and where you no longer would have to label the bar heights. It's like, I can't exactly see it line up. Can you paste in? Oh, that's terrible. So here, you just hover. Great. And you can see that you can turn things off and on. So this is what I was talking about. If you want to compare specific things, and you don't have to, like, oh, can we see it with just those two or just those three? It's like, you can do it yourself. There you go. Uh, now let's compare the code. So we have ggplot data plus geom bar. So we're like, OK, we have the skeleton. Uh, now we want to add a bar. And then it's aesthetics, and you populate it with what you actually want it to plot. You want it to plot color. And fill equals cut, meaning like group. that's a group by cut position. Dodge, so they're stack their bars all next to each other. OK, and then just adding a title. So Really, the core of it is those first two lines where we say, you have, first of all, we're going to do a plot. OK, great. And then you say what you're going to add to it. Very much the same idea over here. So you start with high chart, pipe. Mm, you know that one. And then still same kind of one liner. So the next, whoopsies. So instead of geom bar, it's HC add series. And this one will work for all different types of series. You specify what type you want. Uh, in the high charter world, the type is column. So if you want vertical, it's column. Bar would actually, you could assign bar here, and that would be horizontal instead. So the main differences here is that saying fill equals cut automatically, this automatically counted, uh, kind of did like a histogram style by these groupings. So that count was automatic. Um, I don't think that. You're not going to want to do that here um, when you have group buys. So I first summarized the counts, and that was really the only added step that I did. But that's usually not necessary. It just depends on what kind of data you have going into it. So this idea, basically, you can see really not exceptionally different code. Um, color, is it the x? I specified the y is taught. Um, that was the total, and group by cut. Just group equals cut. OK. Doesn't look scary. Looks a lot like ggplot. Just where ggs are, you swap them out with hcs a lot of the time. So OK, not so bad. And then uh, there's this kind of mapping that I have here that explains what I just said. All right, now let's stack them. OK, great. So the only thing that changed for the ggplot is position equals stack instead of position equals dodge. Same kind of idea in high charts. but. You specify it in a slightly different way. You say stacking. So now there is this stacking attribute, and you can assign it to normal. And that would be normal stacking. There you go. Same thing. So position equals stack. Stacking equals normal. Cool. All right. So far, very similar. All right, next. Um, all right, and now I'm going to move the high chart legend just to show you some legend-based code, because sometimes you want to mess with that and to get it to match to be in the same place. So here we have 
uh, HC legend. So that has its own uh, little you know, uh, layer that you can add in. And there's a line equals right, vertical line equals middle, layout equals vertical. It's going to get you it. Choop, 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 choop. Yep, cool. So not hard. All right. Uh, oh, yeah, fill opacity. OK, so one thing I, I, always, I do change a lot. So a lot of the things where I'm going to talk about are just things that I end up editing a lot or I always want to figure out how to change. So I don't, and I get, I'm very into aesthetics and like the look of things. I want them to be pretty. And I don't really, and I don't like the fully solid colors all the time. Usually I want to mess with the, the opacity. So, so here, now I'm just doing um, a high charts example. But there it is, right in the HC ad series, you can change it directly in there. Uh, opacity equals 0.75. And look at that. And now it's not so bold. All right, so this is all pretty, pretty straightforward, not super hard, not super different, especially from uh, ggplots. So now let's see some other examples with some lines. OK, now we're looking at the Grunfeld investment firm value data because I wanted to, well, it was useful. I needed some, some panel data. So uh, 200 observations, I think 10 different firms spanning over some period of time. Great, great. Uh, that's available in the PLM package. OK, first, markers. This one comes up a lot. So the markers that you get automatically with a line plot are massive. I, they, I'm like, find them. This is ugly. This is terrible. So um, as an extreme, I made them go away. Now let's see how that was done. So first, to just make the line chart, chart it's the exact same idea. You just say line instead of where previously I'd said column. And then this, I always call it H case. I know that it's like, like AES is for aesthetics, but if you say it the way it's supposed to be said, then it's ass, so I just say ace instead. So H case um, is the um, HC version of ace, AES. OK. Uh, mm, right, there it is. All right. So one of the main differences that you'll see is uh, that made it a little bit hard to learn for me a while back is the nest is there's like there's nested attributes. So here in plot options, I have line equals list, marker equals list, radius equals zero. So these are the aesthetics uh, are kind of in a it's coming from a JavaScript library. And so all these things are nested. So where I say line, I actually could have said series. But if I have multiple series in this thing, multiple different things I'm adding on, uh, layering onto this plot, then I want to be specific about which, um, which series I'm trying to modify. So I'm saying, OK, for that line plot, all right, great. Now, there's going to be a lot of different things that I, can, that I can edit for the line plot. Therefore, it's going to go in a list. And now I'm in the list. Great. Now, what about the line plot? The marker. I want to change the marker. OK, well, there's a lot of things you could change, so there's going to be a list. The thing, what do I want to change? The radius. OK, so I set the radius to 0, and now we have uh, you know, no markers. Cool. So that's the idea. That, hap that That's what comes up with the, like, that's the main difference, is this nested list business. But when you see the mapping from where it came from, it makes a lot of sense. So this, I, I started using this in, in 2016 or 2017, and there were very few examples. And you still might find that the, ease, the best examples that you can find um, of exactly what you want to do are actually in the high charts original JavaScript um, uh, documentation. But even though it looks intimidating, it's actually, this is how I learned a lot of this stuff. I just figured out how to, what that mapping was. I'm like, OK, if the JavaScript looks like this, then the R must be this. Does it work? And it generally did. So here you can see this is um, a JavaScript for some chart, whatever. I didn't care about the surrounding things. I just cared about this plot options, because I knew they were modifying the marker radius. And so I see plot options, zooming in on that section, that there's a list, and then series list, marker list. And it maps to exactly the same kind of thing. Those are structurally just about the same. So that's very useful when you can't find an example of what you want exactly. 
the high charts documentation is elaborate and the, it's very useful and once you notice like oh actually that's not so hard I can I can basically guess what what the command is going to be and I have had um, a lot of success doing it that way so fun but I'm also trying to spare you a bit of that by by providing some of this code which will obviously be on my github um, after all right facilitating many comparisons Sometimes, like when I worked for NPR and I was making something for a bunch of different podcasts and we wanted to be able to compare specific podcasts, you don't want it's, it's, to bombard someone with 30 different lines when you know they're probably going to be comparing only one or two of them at a time. So you can set visible equals false so that you can start with a blank slate and then go in and start comparing things. So that, and it's so simple. It's just visible equals false. Um, right there. Um, so hchart, hchart does the same kind of thing as hc add series. It's essentially a shorthand for, you could say, high chart pipe hc add series. Or most of the time, you can just swap out both of those with hchart and specify all the same kind of thing. All right. So that is really cool and can be very useful. Custom hover text. This is probably the most this is one of the things that I love the very most and use the most and uh, saves, saves a lot of time and adds a lot of context. So if you want to change the hover text, so here you can see this is what you get automatically. It says 1942, uh, for, so referencing firm for, the firms are just IDs, and then whatever the value is that I've plotted here. But what if I want to add more information? Like, what if I want to know some of the other things? Um, like gross investment, capital. Like, what if I wanted to know those things? Uh, sure, let's pretend. OK, so you can modify the hover text, and it is very simple. So you give them names, the things that you want to have, you want, want to have displayed. You name them. And then you do a uh, little sprint F uh, that refers to the column names of those things you would like to visualize. Um, this, there's some formatting that I've done here to cut off numerics at, at two decimal places, and that's what that point business is about, but I'm not going to get into it. All right, and then you create the, the tooltip by just combining those two things. So tooltip table, x, y. x is the names, y is the values. And then you use it. So all I've changed from my previous plot is pipe, hc, tooltip, um, use HTML is true, and I point format, I point to the, the name of the tooltip. And then we have a lot more information. So now it is so, so, so easy to just append all that information and how the amount of use you can get out of that to be able to not clutter up a plot, but then be able to provide a whole bunch of context just uh, when you hover over. It's awesome. So that is probably one of the biggest selling points to me because it's like the, the fact that you can hover is is so great, like that compared to a just printed PNG and you're like, want to you know, can, give me more context, give me more context, but you won't, you're just static. But so being able to modify the hover is awesome. All right, so this last example um, is very fancy, but it actually wasn't that hard and I'm gonna show you. So this is from a data set that I made up. Uh, well, it's based on a real data set that I was doing a progression of models and getting the, um, precision and recall and sort of plotting the trade-off between precision and recall of these uh, many iterations of this model. So I had 18 iterations and there was a baseline uh, performance for precision and recall and then there was a goal. So the point was, okay, can we reach this goal through this particular uh, path of uh, model iterations? And so I wanted to visualize the progress of this thing, um, so I made this super cool plot here that shows the precision and the recall and how they're changing over the, um, each iteration of the model and the goal up here in green. So if, it, if any of the lines go above goal, the goal, then they would turn green. If they were in, um, in between, if they were below the goal, they were just normal color. And if they were below the baseline, they went gray. So I'm not gonna have uh, time really to walk through each piece of this, but it will be in the code. And the idea is, as long as you know what things are called, then you can modify them. But sometimes it's hard to know what to even search for, what things are called. So in this case, um, 
for like the horizontal lines, for example, are, um, oh yeah, all right. So coloring is called uh, zones, right? Yeah, zones. So if you want to try to actually change the color of the line as it hits different Y values, that is called zones. And um, that's, I'm just gonna stop there, but this code is going to be available on GitHub and please admire how beautiful this plot is and it wasn't even hard. <laughs>